Okay, thanks, Amit. Uh, so again, my name is Omer. I'm going to talk about the cryptographic hardness of finding a Nash equilibrium. And this is a joint work with Neil Bitansky and uh, Alon Rosen. Maybe we can close the door over there? Thanks. OK. So uh, our story today starts with game theory, with the notion of Nash equilibrium. Uh, but pretty soon, using the help of Christos Papadimitriou, we're going to kind of put aside game theory and move on to uh, talking about purely complexity theoretic questions. And then we're going to answer these questions using tools from crypto. OK, so let's go ahead and get started with uh, some game theory. So the purpose of game theory is to uh, study how strategic players act in states of conflict. And the way we usually model these states is using games where the players have a set of possible actions. And based on the player's actions, we can de determine the outcome of the game and also the utilities for the different players. So a central notion in game theory is the notion of Nash equilibrium. So a Nash equilibrium is just a, a set of strategies for the different players that are, in some sense, stable, meaning that starting from these strategies, no individual player has an incentive to change their strategy. So Nash Equilibrium is one of the most useful tools we have for predicting the behavior of rational players. And perhaps one of the properties of Nash Equilibrium that makes it so useful is the fact that it always exists. So a famous theorem by John Nash says that in every game, there is a set of perhaps probabilistic strategies that form an equilibrium. OK, so in every game, there exists a Nash equilibrium. Now, as game theorists, we may be completely set aside with such a statement. But as computer scientists, just knowing that something exists is usually not enough. Uh, we also want to know whether a Nash equilibrium of a game can be computed efficiently. So here, the answer is uh, already much less clear. Today, we don't have any polynomial time algorithm for computing a Nash equilibrium. As far as we know, this problem may be intractable. So understanding the complexity of uh, finding a Nash equilibrium is a fascinating question from a purely algorithmic perspective. But even beyond that, if we do realize that finding a Nash equilibrium uh, is an intractable problem, this would be a major drawback for, uh, of Nash as a solution concept, as a way to predict the, behave, the behaviors of players in the real world. And putting this in the words of uh, Kamal Jain, if your laptop can find it, then neither can the market. OK, so today we want to understand how hard it is to find a Nash equilibrium. So let's go ahead and get started with some complexity classes. So here we have the classes FP and FNP. These are just the functional versions of uh, P and NP. They contain search problems instead of decision problems. And the problem Nash is contained in a subclass of FNP called TFNP. So TFNP is the class that contains total search problems. These are search problems that, for every instance, there always exists at least one solution. So the problem Nash really is in TFNP exactly because of Nash's existence theorem. OK, so now Megiddo and Papadimitriou showed that unless the polynomial hierarchy collapses, you cannot have a reduction from an NP-complete problem to a problem in TFNP. So this means that we cannot hope to prove that Nash is NP-complete. But maybe we can try and prove the next best thing. Maybe we can show that Nash is, in fact, complete for TFNP. The problem with the suggestion is that we don't really know how to prove that things are complete for TFNP. We don't even know if this class even contains complete problems. So a, a suggestion by Papa Dimitrio is to instead try and study kind of large subclasses of TFNP, where we group together problems according to the type of combinatorial argument used in their uh, proof of totality. So today, uh, we're going to focus on one of these subclasses called PPAD, PPAD. And as we'll see, the class PPAD is closely related to the complexity of Nash. So very roughly, uh, PPAD uh, contains total search problems where uh, the totality is proven via a parity argument in directed graphs. So this is uh, still kind of vague. So let me also uh, give you the formal definition. So formally, uh, PPAD is defined in terms of its complete problem. So PPAD contains all total search problems that are reducible to a problem called end of the line. So let me tell you a bit more about this end of the line problem. So this is a, a combinatorial problem on graphs. So the input to the problem is a directed graph, uh, where the in degree and the out degree of every node is at most 1, 0 or 1. 
So this graph is just a collection of disjoint paths and cycles. And you're also given a source node in this graph, just the start point of some path. And your goal is to find uh, another source or sink in the graph, just any one of these green endpoints. So uh, you can see that this problem always have a solution by a simple parity argument. Uh, if the graph has a source, it must also have at least one sink. So now if the graph is relatively small, then solving this problem is uh, really easy. So really we're interested in solving the end of the line problem on exponential size graphs. Uh, that are given to us using some succinct representation. Specifically, uh, the nodes of the graph will be represented by n-bit strings, and the edges are given to us using a pair of uh, programs, S and P, that given any node V in the graph, these programs tell us what is the successor and predecessor of this node. Okay, so now the naive way to solve the end of the line problem is to just start from the source and follow the edges of the graph until you reach a sink. But because the graph is very large, this naive approach may take exponential time. Okay, this is the end of the line problem. Now let's go back to uh, uh, the problem of Nash and uh, see what does it have to do with it. So uh, Papa Dimitrios showed that Nash is contained in the class PPAD by giving a reduction to the end of the line problem. And he also conjectured that Nash is in fact PPAD complete, meaning that there's also a reduction in the other direction. So 10, ten years later, in a remarkable sequence of work, Dastalagis, Goldberg, and Papadimitriou, and Chen and Dang uh, proved this conjecture. So they show that you can solve an arbitrary end-of-the-line instance by just finding the Nash equilibrium of some related gain. So the bottom line here is that the class PPAD exactly captures the complexity of uh, finding a Nash equilibrium. And this means that from now on we can kind of put aside game theory and uh, just focus on understanding the end-of-the-line problem. Okay, so let's uh, sum up what we already know. So we talked about this class PPAD. It has complete problems such as the end of the line problem in Nash. It's also known to contain uh, other interesting problem related to finding fixed points of continuous functions. And even though none of these problems uh, is known to be NP-complete, is likely to be NP-complete, still we don't know how to solve any of these problems efficiently. So we can kind of uh, conjecture that the class PPAD really is hard. But still, if someone comes up tomorrow with an algorithm showing that the class PPAD is in fact easy, this would be a really interesting and surprising algorithmic development, but I'm not sure how much it would affect the way that uh, we as complexity theorists and cryptographers think about the world. So really what we're looking for is some additional evidence for the fact that the class PPAD really is hard. So a very natural place to look for such, for such hardness is in crypto. And the reason that cryptographic problems such as factoring, discrete log, or learning with error are a good place to look for people's hardness is because, first of all, we think that these problems are hard, but they're also not too hard. None of these problems uh, is believed to be NP-complete. So a natural question asked uh, already by Papa Dimitrio is whether we can uh, base people's hardness on crypto. So this is exactly what we're going to do today. We'll, today we'll show that uh, the class PPAD is hard based on cryptographic assumptions. Specifically, we'll use the hardness of indistinguishability obfuscation. OK, so uh, back to our story. We started by uh, asking, what is the complexity of finding a Nash equilibrium? We translated it to a, a problem on graphs, uh, the end of the line problem. And now we're going to show that this problem is hard based on indistinguishability obfuscation. OK, so I'm going to start with a few words of uh, intuition about program obfuscation and what does it have to do uh, with the end of the line problem. So uh, as you probably already know, an obfuscator is just a compiler that uh, takes a program and makes it unintelligible. So ideally, obfuscating a program should be equivalent to taking this program and putting it inside a black box. So now uh, back to the end of the line problem. I'm going to uh, show you a folklore construction of a hard end-of-the-line instance based on ideal program obfuscation. So this construction, except from obfuscation, it will also use a pseudorandom permutation, fk. And now our instance is as follows. We start with the source, which is just the all zero string. And for every node v, we connect an edge between v and f of v. So this defines a long path and the end of this path, the sync, is just the pre-image of the all zero string. So from here we can't uh, continue, otherwise we'll kind of wrap back around to the source. 
So the successor and predecessor programs that define this instance uh, are essentially just computing the function, the uh, pseudorandom permutation f, forward and backward, except on these endpoints where we need to explicitly make sure we don't wrap around. Now if I just give you the successor and predecessor program, including the description of the secret key k in the clear, then it will be very easy for you to, solve the, to find the sync and solve this instance. So instead our instance is going to contain uh, these programs obfuscated. So now it's not uh, difficult to prove that uh, if this obfuscation has ideal security, if you only have black box access to the successor and predecessor program, then the nodes on this path look completely random to you. And the only way you can actually find the end of the path is by explicitly uh, invoking the successor program super polynomially many times. OK. So this construction already gives us a hard end of the line instance. But only based on this very strong notion of ideal or virtual black box obfuscation. And uh, the problem with this suggestion is that we don't really believe in ideal obfuscation. In fact, we have uh, several impossibility results and lower bounds uh, for this uh, notion. Some of these uh, lower bounds apply specifically for the case of obfuscating pseudorandom functions. So instead, what we're going to do today is construct, show the hardness of the end of the line problem based on indistinguishability obfuscation, which is a much weaker and also more believable uh, notion of obfuscation. So just as a reminder, indistinguishability obfuscation lets us take any two equivalent programs and turn them into obfuscated programs that are computationally indistinguishable. Okay, so our main theorem says that assuming uh, indistinguishability of obfuscation with sub-exponential security, and also, of course, one-way functions, the end-of-the-line problem is hard. Uh, we can even show that the end-of-the-line problem is uh, sub-exponentially hard, but, of course, there is some loss in parameters here. We also show that the end-of-the-line problem is hard on average, so we construct uh, an explicit hard distribution over end-of-the-line instances. Okay, so now a very important question, especially in light of this result, is how much should we really believe in the hardness of I.O.? So this is a question that was uh, discussed in depth during this workshop, and I'm going to say a few more words about this uh, in my conclusion. Okay, so uh, let's prove this theorem. Uh, let's construct a hard end-of-the-line instance using indistinguishability obfuscation. And uh, as is often the case, our construction is going to be rather different than the previous one based on ideal obfuscation. Okay. So except from uh, I.O., we're going to use a pseudorandom function, fk. So before we used a pseudorandom permutation, now we're using a pseudorandom function. The reason is that later in the proof, we're going to puncture this function. And this is something that we don't know how to do with permutations. OK, so just like before, our instance looks like a long path. But now every node on this path is a pair of the form i sigma i, where sigma i just denotes the evaluation of the pseudorandom function fk on i. The nodes are ordered according to the value of i, starting from 1 all the way up to some exponential number, capital N. OK, so now let's uh, write down the successor and predecessor program that define this instance. So the successor program will have the secret key uh, k hard-coded, so it can uh, compute all the sigma i values. And now given a node i comma sigma, if this is the sync, we just say sync. If this is another node of the form i sigma i, then we just return the next node on the path. And you also need to say what happens if this node is not of the form i sigma i, meaning that it's not even on this path. So in this case, we just make this node into a self-loop by uh, outputting the node unchanged as the successor of itself. So really, our graph looks like this long path and also many, many self-loops. And now that adding these self-loops uh, doesn't really introduce any new solutions to our instance, still the only sync in this graph is the node n sigma n. OK, so now the predecessor programs is defined similarly. And uh, just like before, we don't want to give you these programs, including the secret key k in the clear. So we obfuscate them using indistinguishability obfuscation. So now our goal is to prove that given the obfuscated successor and predecessor programs, it's hard to find the sync. Specifically, it's hard to find the value of sigma n. 
And actually, we're going to start by proving uh, uh, an easier statement. We're going to just prove that it's hard to find sigma n based on the obfuscated successor program. We're going to forget about the predecessor for now. So our proof strategy is as follows. We have the successor program S. We're going to prove that it's indistinguishable from another program, S prime. The program X prime describes a similar graph, except that uh, in this graph, the last node, N sigma N, is a self-loop instead of a sink. So now proving that these two uh, programs are indistinguishable is really enough because if you could find the value of sigma n from any one of these programs, then you can also distinguish these programs by just evaluating them on the last node and testing whether you got a sync or a self-loop. So we need to show that these two programs are computationally indistinguishable. And note that these programs are not functionally equivalent. They behave differently on the last node. So we can't directly use IO security. We need to do something a bit more sophisticated. Okay, so we want to show that the programs that describe these graphs are computationally indistinguishable. And the high level idea is to transition between these graphs in a sequence of very small steps. And every one of these steps is designed in such a way that we can really prove indistinguishability of the graphs using I.O. So, so they differ only on one point? They may differ on more. All I care about is that I didn't define the top graph explicitly, but all we need from this graph is that it is a self loop in the last node. This would be enough. Can't you say like DIO with one point? Yeah, but this, so this is kind of what we're saying. The crucial part of the, of the proof is to show that it's hard to find this point. So this is uh, indirectly what we're trying to do. OK, so I'm going to describe the sequence of steps. Uh, and then I'll prove indistinguishability of every step. So in the first step, we're going to uh, take a random node on this chain. And we're going to remove its outgoing edge. So this essentially breaks the chain into two parts. And what we want to do now is take a look at the second part of the chain and break it apart edge by edge. So note that this graph already depends on the random edge that we removed. So if we want to remove the next edge, we can't just apply the first step again, because now the next edge is no longer random. So we need a new type of step. So in our second type of step, we are allowed to take an arbitrary node whose in degree is 0 and turn it into a self-loop. So once we do this once, now we have a new node whose in degree is 0. And we can apply the step again. <coughs> so we just apply the step again and again until we reach the end of the chain. So note that this argument has an exponential number of steps uh, of the same order as capital N. So this is where we rely on sub-exponential security. OK, so now uh, I want to prove the indistinguishability of the two steps. Uh, and before I do that, I'm going to prove a more general lemma that is going to be very useful. So the setting of this lemma is as follows. Uh, we start with a program, A. It's a completely arbitrary program. And we also defined another program, B sub RZ, that computes exactly the same function as A, except on one uh, input R, where this program outputs z. So now the lemma says that for a random input r and for every output z, the indistinguishability of obfuscation of the programs a and b r z are computationally indistinguishable. So again, the statement of the lemma says that you can take an arbitrary program, change its output on a random input, and this change will be indistinguishable under I.O. So the proof of this uh, lemma is pretty simple. It's an application of the sparse triggers technique of Sahai and Waters. Uh, I'm going to skip the proof, but I will show you how to use this lemma uh, in order to uh, prove indistinguishability of our two steps. So in the first step, uh, we wanted to take a random node, r sigma r, and remove its outgoing edge. So if uh, our previous successor program was s, our new successor program is s prime. It computes the same function as s, except on input i equal to r, where we output, say, bottom. So now these two programs are indeed indistinguishable exactly following our lemma. OK, so the proof of the second step is just a bit more complicated. I'm not going to go into uh, all the details. I'll just give the high level idea. So in the second step, we wanted to take a node whose in degree, an arbitrary node, i sigma i, whose in degree is 0, 
and turn it into a self loop. So now the index i is not necessarily random, so we can't apply the same argument as before. But the value of sigma i is pseudo random. So we want to use that. So first we're going to use a trick called puncturing to make sure that sigma i uh, looks random even given the successor program that can compute all the other sigmas. And here it will be very important that the integree of this node is really zero because if the successor program explicitly outputs uh, the value sigma i, then uh, we won't be able to replace it with a random string. Okay, so after we establish that sigma i uh, really is pseudo-random, uh, we can just use our uh, lemma again to change the value of the successor program on this node. Okay, so uh, this is the indistinguishability for proof for the two-step. This concludes the proof that we cannot find uh, the sync sigma n based on the obfuscated successor program. So we're almost done. Uh, if you remember, in the beginning of the proof, we made a simplifying assumption the, and got rid of the predecessor program. So let's bring it right back. So now it turns out that uh, the proof we just saw completely breaks down. So uh, let me show you just where it breaks down. So it breaks down in the second step, where we uh, kind of use the fact that if the integree of a node is 0, then the successor program never explicitly outputs this node. But now the predecessor program outputs this node. So our proof doesn't work anymore. So we thought about it a bit, and it seems like uh, just doing more I.O. gymnastics is not going to help us here. And uh, eventually the solution really comes from somewhere completely different. So, so the solution is based on an observation of uh, Abbott, Kane, and Valiant. So they show that if you have a path that satisfies some sort of verifiability property that our construction uh, does satisfy, then you don't really need to give out the predecessor program. You can somehow simulate it using only the successor program. Okay, so this sounds incredible. This is based on a, a theorem of Bennett from 84, uh, talking about reversible computation. It says that any computation can be simulated in a reversible way by incurring only a very small overhead. So this is a, kind of a very cool theorem. If you want to know more about how we use it uh, in our proof, uh, you're welcome to come talk to me after or just take a look at the paper. Okay, so uh, let me just conclude. So we talked about the hardness of uh, many different problems. So let's kind of recap by trying to follow this hardness. So we started with uh, the problem of finding a Nash equilibrium of a game. We saw that this is as hard as the end of the line problem on graphs. And today we proved that this is as hard as breaking indistinguishability obfuscation. Now today our constructions of indistinguishability obfuscation are based on uh, multilinear maps. Uh, but here the assumptions that we use are maybe not as nice or as clean as we would like them to be yet. And our multilinear maps in turn are based on lattices. And uh, again, we still don't know how to base security on standard assumptions. So there is still some work to be done. But uh, the bottom line is that if you follow this long chain of reductions, you can actually design games that somehow embed inside them a hard lattice problems. Uh, that's it. Thank you.